China's Heavenly Palace, the Tiangong is the most advanced space station ever deployed by the human race, and that's a big deal, but it's not really something that the people in the Western world really understand very well or even know that much about. The Chinese have reinvented the space station for the 21st century, and this is how they've done it. This is the Space Race. The thing is, we've been putting space stations into orbit since the early 1970s, but the Tiangong is the first one to stand out as something that looks more like science fiction than the status quo, which is essentially just a submarine in space. Did you know that the first space station ever deployed was a single module Soviet design from 1971 called the Salyut? And then two years later in 1973, NASA topped that with their own station named Skylab, which was built inside a hollowed out upper stage of the gigantic Saturn V moon rocket. But it was in 1986 that the world saw the deployment of the first ever modular space station, which the Soviets named Mir. It would take a decade to assemble the seven module Mir station, and even with the collapse of the Soviet Union coming right in the middle of the project, the Russians would cement themselves as the leaders in space station development. So when we finally arrive at the International Space Station that we all know so well today, we can see that it shares a lot of resemblance with Russia's Mir. In fact, given that the Russians had decades of experience with multiple space stations, and NASA had virtually zero practical knowledge, I don't think it's unfounded to look at the ISS more like a Mir version 2.0, because it's pretty clear where this design approach came from. If we look back from Salyut to Skylab to Mir to ISS, we're not exactly seeing a massive amount of progress or evolution to the design. If anything, the Skylab really sticks out as being the nicest space station of the bunch, and that was literally 50 years ago. The Soviet design aesthetic that carried over all the way to ISS has a lot more in common with a submarine than the Starship Enterprise. It's cramped, it's cluttered, there are pipes and wires and god knows what else sticking out from all angles. Now we flip forward to China's Tiangong and the difference is night and day. There are only about 20 years between the ISS and Tiangong, but it looks like a century worth of progress. The Tiangong now consists of three modules forming a T-shaped space station 55 meters long and 39 meters wide that orbits around 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The Tianhe is the core command module, first launched in April 2021. The Wenxian experiment module serves as a combination of crew quarters, research lab, and airlock, which was added in July 2022. The Mengxian module is a twin to the Wenxian and functions purely as a research and experiment space and joined the station in November 2022. As far as space stations go, this is an incredibly rapid pace of construction. It took Russia and NASA two years just to get the ISS to a state where it was habitable and it was a 10-year international endeavor for ISS to reach a state of completion. And while it might seem like this station came out of nowhere, this is actually phase three of a plan that China started all the way back in the 90s that they called Project 921. This is kind of like China's blueprint to conquer space. Phase one of the plan was the development and launch of a crew-capable rocket and spacecraft. These would be the Long March 2F and the Shenzhou, which both launched for the first time in 1999. The Long March series of rockets take their name from Mao Zedong's history as a war hero and leader of the People's Red Army. The name Shenzhou means divine vessel. By 2003, this system had put the first Chinese Taikonaut into low Earth orbit on the Shenzhou 5 mission. This began phase two of the plan, which was essentially a practice phase. By Shenzhou 7, the Chinese had performed their first spacewalk using their own extravehicular suits. Following that, the country began to deploy test modules that were like miniature space stations. Chinese crews would make their first extended stays in space and practice docking maneuvers between the test modules and the Shenzhou. This time also marked the development of China's Tianzhou spacecraft or Heavenly Ship, which is a cargo transport vehicle with a carrying capacity of 6,500 kilograms. This spacecraft was designed to fly on the new Long March 7 rocket, a modern replacement for the 2F that was first launched in 2016. Phase 3 of the plan is where we are at right now, the development and assembly of a new space station, the Tiangong or 
Heavenly Palace. So why does China feel so strongly about creating their very own space station? Well, for one, because it's really cool, who wouldn't want their own personal hangout in space? But for two, also it probably has to do with the Chinese being banned from the International Space Station, which is obviously counterintuitive to the literal name of the station, but in 2011, the United States decided that China was prohibited from visiting the station. The Chinese ban was specifically rolled out through a Department of Defense Act passed in the US Congress which stipulated that NASA may not use their funding to collaborate in any way with China. The reasons given focused around human rights issues and national security. But more than anything, the US was afraid that China would steal their ideas or spy on them or something to that effect, which is a reasonable concern given that both the US and China have been heavily involved in a ton of shady spy stuff for the better part of a century, and that's created a lot of paranoia. Anyway, the Chinese decided to hell with them, we'll build our own, and here we are. The first thing that you'll notice about the interior of the Tiangong is that it looks spacious and wide open, especially compared to the ISS. Tiangong has a very minimalist modern design. What's interesting is that the outer diameter of the Tiangong modules are nearly the exact same as the diameter of the ISS modules, about 4.2 meters or 14 feet across. So the difference is in the volume of internal space available. There are a few reasons for that. For one, the ISS modules are typically much shorter with more connection points in between that create bottlenecks in the structure. For example, the Destiny Lab on the ISS, which is the primary operating facility for US astronauts, is 8.4 meters or 28 feet long, while the Wenxian and Mengtian modules are both 18 meters or 59 feet in length. And for two, the technology on Tiangong is just much more modern and therefore smaller and able to fit into a smaller space. For example, many of the systems on Tiangong will connect wirelessly instead of having to run a labyrinth of cables around like what we see on the ISS. Also, much of the technology on the Tiangong is hidden behind these plain white panels when not in use. I don't know if that's more functional or just aesthetic or if they straight up don't want anyone else to be able to see what they're working on, but it does make the station look very clean and modern. I love strategy games and history, which brings us to today's sponsor and a game that has genuinely impressed me, Conflict of Nations. Picture this, it's the late 20th and early 21st century, a time of modern warfare, where strategy isn't just about commanding units on the battlefield, but managing resources, alliances, and cutting-edge technology. This is where Conflict of Nations steps in. It's a free online PvP strategy game where you take control of a real country and engage in World War III scenarios. What drew me to it? Realism. Not only do you lead a nation in real-time combat against up to 128 other players, but the game rounds can take weeks to conclude. It's all about deep strategic planning and on-the-spot tactical decisions. Diverse units, from nuclear ballistic submarines, stealth strike fighters, to airborne infantry units, the game boasts over 100 beautifully modeled modern weapon systems. Tech and Strategy. An extensive military research tree offers over 250 items for you to explore and enhance your nation's capabilities. Collaborations. As with modern warfare, alliances play a key role. The game allows you to form cooperative clans and team up for collective objectives. Accessibility. And the best part, whether you're on PC or mobile, you can dive into this game seamlessly with the same account. Conflict of Nations is about immersing yourself in strategy, engaging in epic battles, and aiming for world domination. And guess what? For all of you strategy enthusiasts, there's an exclusive gift waiting. Click the link in the description to get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription absolutely free. But act fast, this offer is only around for 30 days. Before we sign off, a reminder for the tacticians out there, dive into the modern global warfare of Conflict of Nations, craft your strategy, lead your nation, and engage in monumental battles. Click the link below and claim your 13,000 gold and a month of premium subscription. Choose, conquer, and celebrate your victories. So if you're up for the challenge, select your country and may the best strategist claim victory. Let me know which country you're picking and why in the comments below. The first module of Tiangong successfully reached orbit in April of 2021. This core structure is called the Tianhe, which means Harmony of the Heavens. 
The Tianhe is a 20-ton structure with a maximum diameter of 4.2 meters and contains everything necessary for a functional space station that can support a crew of three. It has solar panels, propulsion systems, life support, a robotic arm, and a sophisticated docking node and airlock. There are three main sections to the core module. Starting at the smaller end, there is a spherical multi-docking node. This has four ports, with one obviously being permanently attached to the Tianhe. The port opposite to the core module is the main docking port for the station. This is where the Shenzhou crew vehicle can dock. The two side ports on the multi-docking node are berthing ports for the twin research labs to the core module. The bottom port on the node is a second crew docking port. This is for use during crew handovers when two groups of three Taikonauts are occupying the station simultaneously. And the top port is actually not a docking port at all, it's a hatchway. This is for the crew to exit the station and perform spacewalks. Moving up to the narrow cylindrical section of Tianhe, this is the crew quarters. There are individual bunks for three crew members and all of the necessary facilities like the space toilet. And then at the wider end of the core module is a working area with three experimental racks. This is also where the propulsion section for the station is located. This maintains orbital control. And lastly, there is another docking port at the end of the module that is specifically for the Tianzhou cargo craft. This is also a future docking port for the Chinese Space Telescope. The Tianhe is also the module that supports the station's main robotic arm, which is 10 meters in length. It's a little shorter than the Canada Arm 2 that is currently in operation at the ISS, which is 17 meters long, but the Chinese Arm does have a similar capability and the possibility for expansion. More on that in a bit. On July 24th, 2022, China launched their Wenxian Research Laboratory module for the Tiangong. The name Wenxian translates as Heavenly Quest. This is another 20-ton structure that was deployed on the Long March 5B rocket. This is China's first heavy lift space launcher and is responsible for getting the three modules of the Tiangong into their 400 km high orbit. The Long March 5B configuration is a really interesting rocket design. It uses a hydrogen fuel burning core stage and is strapped with four liquid fueled side boosters that burn RP 1 kerosene. This combination makes the Long March 5B the third most powerful rocket currently in service around the world behind the Falcon Heavy at number 1 and the Delta IV Heavy. The process that this particular rocket uses to put these 20-ton payloads into their orbital path is pretty unique and very controversial. So, once the rocket clears Earth's atmosphere, which happens at about 100 kilometers in altitude, those four side boosters will drop off, but the core booster engine will continue to burn. A typical rocket will have a full stage separation at this point, where the entire lower section of the rocket will detach and fall back down to Earth, where it usually splashes into the ocean. And again, on a typical rocket, a second stage engine will then fire up to propel what's left of the rocket and the payload into the orbital insertion. The Long March 5B doesn't do that. After the four side boosters drop off, the rocket stays whole and the core booster engines propel the module all the way to its orbital insertion point before finally separating. That means the majority of the rocket structure is now in orbit, so it won't just fall straight back down into the ocean. But it's not in a stable orbit either, so it won't stay up there for too long. It's going to circle the Earth for a few days as it slowly loses altitude and gets pulled back into the atmosphere. Now, these are just too big to vaporize like a regular satellite. It doesn't stay whole, but chunks are going to make it all the way down to the surface of the Earth. And that's why this particular Long March 5B booster stage broke up over the Indian Ocean and rained down scrap metal over the islands of Indonesia. Anyway, the Wenxian module serves dual purpose on the space station. It has an additional three crew sleeping quarters that bring the total capacity of the station up to six people at once. And it also provides space for a variety of scientific experiments. It also houses two giant solar panels that give the module a 55 meter wingspan from tip to tip. These are state-of-the-art solar cells that are super thin and flexible to maximize the amount of surface area that could be deployed. They're also extremely efficient and generate around 7 kilowatts of electricity for the station. There are four experimental rack spaces on the Wenxian containing research projects on life sciences, biotechnology, and variable gravity effects. 
Then moving towards the smaller end of the module, there is a space for external experiments. This is basically a section where they can attach nodes to the outside hull of the ship to collect data. And crew can access the external attachment points through the airlock and hatch on the Wencian. This will become the primary airlock of the station for spacewalks. And the crew can also access these attachment points using a secondary robotic arm that comes with the Wencian. This one is just 5 meters in length, but the cool thing about this arm is that it can actually crawl around the station and operate from different locations. So there are multiple attachment points for the arm around the station, and to crawl, the arm just grabs onto the next attachment point and then lets go of the previous attachment point. It can just keep repeating this maneuver all around the station, like a kind of weird robotic caterpillar thing. What's more, this secondary arm can actually link up with the main arm to form one 15 meter long robotic arm that would essentially match the size and capability of the Canada Arm 2 on the ISS. The third and final big piece of the puzzle is called the Mengtian, or Heavenly Dream. This is another research laboratory module that arrived at Tiangong in October 2022. The Mengtian is going to be very similar to the Wenxian, with the biggest difference being that Mengtian doesn't have any crew sleeping quarters, so it offers more space for experimental racks. Also, the Mengtian is equipped with its own airlock that will function as a secondary cargo port. The Mengxian also has its own giant solar panel array, identical to the Wenxian, so the addition of the third module has fully energized the station and brought it up to full functionality. And then there's the Chinese Space Telescope. All we know is that it is currently in development and will likely have similar capabilities to the Hubble Telescope. This is designed to operate independently from the Tiangong, it will orbit close by, but it's not an attached section of the station. The telescope will have the capability to dock with the Tiangong so that it can be easily serviced and upgraded over time, which is something that can't easily be done with the Hubble and is virtually impossible to do with James Webb, so that is a big advantage. Beyond that, we already have word that China is considering another expansion to the Tiangong. At a recent meeting of the International Astronautical Congress, Chinese officials revealed plans to expand the Tiangong station from three modules to six. China plans to launch a new multifunctional expansion module sometime in the coming years. They believe that additional full-size modules will begin to join that station in around four years' time. As it stands, there will be a limited number of international research projects arriving at Tiangong in collaboration with the United States Office for Outer Space Affairs and the European Space Agency. So that's a great start, but with the relatively small size right now of the Tiangong, we're not likely to see international crew members up there for a visit, though an expansion in the future could change that. We definitely won't be seeing any Americans involved with Tiangong. The same wolf amendment that prevents the Chinese from ever visiting the ISS works both ways and would prohibit American astronauts from having anything to do with the Chinese station. So hopefully that's helped everyone to get a better picture of how the Tiangong operates and what's going on up there. This information is very hard to come by and that's really unfortunate. Hopefully there's going to be a day where global political tensions cool off and we can all work together and stuff. Of course, given the current situation and based on whatever is happening right now around Taiwan, that clearly won't be the case anytime soon. So this will have to do for now. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.